And here we have a little bear who is, uh, if he works, is going to be part of a game I won't describe. But uh, he is really nasty today. Yeah. Hello, Richard. You don't mind if I call you Richard, I hope. That's not exactly novel. There are, there are other talking bears out there and that have synchronized lip motion, which is a, a real acute part. You know, they'll have the mouth moving in a realistic way. What you do with it is another story. What game or how you make of it, that's the hard part. So that's what I'm working on. Well, I'm, uh, I'm Ralph Baer. That's B-A-E-R, although lots of people spell it B-A-E-R, which I object to. And I have no relationship to bears. Uh, I live in Manchester, New Hampshire for the last uh, 53 years. Before that, in New York. Before that, in the Army. Before that, in New York. Before that, in Europe. Born in Germany. Left uh, Germany in 1938, two months ahead of the Nazis. Got real lucky. Yeah, taught myself electronics through correspondence courses. I've been cranking out uh, toys and games, electronic toys and games, after a 30-year career on military electronics. And here's one of the talking books we talked about earlier, a recordable talking book. Uh, record a word to describe how something rotten looks. Stinky! Oh, forget. Stinky! I don't know whether it works, we'll soon see. I uh, didn't record the second button. Batteries are low, but that was the general idea. You a major claim to fame, obviously, is having come up with a concept of uh, video games. The concept was to have uh, ordinary people in their homes uh, uh, interact with a television set. And think about it, a television set for the technology of the day was a pretty complex device, but it was cheap. Why? Because it was mass-produced. So I thought that if I can attach something to a TV set, anything, you know, I would have a real business. You know? That was the motivation. And what I want to show you here is uh, uh, a series of replicas of ancient games. This was the second game we built, number two, the game that we used to demonstrate uh, to the board of directors and the president of Sanders. Uh, we built our own joysticks for it, uh, our own handgun and a pump handle for playing games. What I got up there at the moment is game number... In the second game, let's have a steeplechase. One player is the hunter, the other is the red fox. The hunter chases the fox to wipe him out. Like so. I just wiped out the fox. Uh, when, when we first started out, before I had Bill Harrison, who came on in May of 67, in this little room of ours, before I had him build a, a video game, I had him go out and buy a plastic gun, for the, uh, uh, not for, uh, for a video game, but for a quiz game. <clears throat> we had a way of putting up, up uh, spots on the screen that were, were different uh, from each other so you could recognize which spot represented the proper answer, you know. But then uh, pretty soon I, yeah, I looked at that gun and I said, hey, we, we can use this gun to shoot at the screen. A light gun game, of course, yeah. yeah. You put a single spot on the screen and and go uh, point at the, at the spot, and if you're lined up properly, the spot disappears. Meanwhile, your partner can be moving the spot around for, for a moving target. We never built one-player games because we thought games as family entertainment. Huh? Uh, a few months later, when Bill Rush joined us and we noodled ideas almost daily, I came up with a business of a, a machine control spot, and ball games started popping up that were really has something. The ball volume back and forth, uh, one free ball plus one net, courtesy of a local CATV station. Here's my partner Bill, a one, a two, a three, and down I go. And up I go, <laughs> and down I go. Now watch me fake him up. I didn't do it. Ah, I did it this time, okay. Once we had ping pong, we knew we're in. And then stupid like engineers are, uh, oh, add another couple of transistors here, we can do this. Add something more here, we can do this. And we stretched the project out for another year off and on. When we should have stopped after we had ping pong, because that's all people would wanted to have. And once we showed the brown box, which played all those other games, nobody played anything but ping pong. And here we are in uh, 
1967, we've got a demonstration going, and the question was, now that we've got something, what do we do with it? Yeah. Who's the ultimate customer? Right. Who produces this thing? And my reaction was, well, maybe the cable business would be interested in perhaps doing interactive stuff over the cable. Imagine if this is 1967. Do interactive stuff over the cable is the answer to my question of what to do with uh, video uh, games. The demo which you're about to see and hopefully participate in represents some of the recent developments at Sanders in participatory CATV. CATV gaming. But if you look at uh, demonstrations I made in the early 70s, they, they concentrate on this business of doing games, uh, doing interactive uh, uh, impulse buying over the cable. I did all that stuff back in the early 70s, and I uh, evangelized it throughout the 70s. And I talked to Warners and, and other companies uh, uh, that were in the cable business, and we tried this and we tried that, and it all worked technically, but we were... 10, 15, 20 years too soon. Yeah, until the web came along, a new cable, right? and did all those things, like falling off a log. Like technically it worked though? Oh yeah. You know, you sit there, you're a client, you're watching TV, commercial comes on, you push a button, it stores uh, information, so you can pick up the phone, put your, your telephone on the acoustic modem, <laughs> and download that stuff and order the stuff. Right. With this box, when a commercial comes on, which is designed to work in this impulse buying environment, and it takes a special kind of commercial to do this, which involves some of the techniques which we call the video modem and audio modem techniques, uh, which we developed here at Sanders. Uh, all he does is pick up his little box, push the button, a tape recorder starts, the message, the audio message, as it comes out of the speaker of the TV set is recorded. I can now order the goods, which I decided to, on impulse, decide to order the night before. And I do this by picking up my telephone and placing it on the audio modem portion of my all-purpose box. I push the appropriate digital numbers on my keyboard, dial up an 800 number, and automatically the tape recorder will start running. It will play back last night's recorded message, which contains all the necessary information in coded form, and all this zips out over the telephone line and is recorded at the other end by appropriate equipment, possibly by a computer-controlled uh, machine. I promoted that for a while, then you go anywhere either. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, life is 10% success, 90% try this, try that, try the other thing. It looks great, sounds great, works great, doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> That's so it goes. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, uh, we uh, demonstrated uh, the brown box, which was the end of seven different models of video games we built in the lab, to, uh, in 1969, to RCA, Sylvania, Motorola, GE, uh, I forgot a few others. Uh, TV game manufacturers, everybody said, hey, this is creative, it's great, and nobody came up with a dime, except RCA. By the time we got through negotiating a contract with those guys, it was so onerous we walked away from it. Fortunately for us, one of the members of the team left, joined Magnavox as a VP for marketing, and said to the guys in Fort Wayne at Magnavox headquarters, you really ought to look at that again. So off we are to Fort Wayne. Uh, Jerry Martin, who ran the, uh, uh, the television uh, receiver and phonograph and radio division said it's a goal just like that. One guy with vision. And then they had, the engineers had a year to convert the Brown Box into what became the Magnavox Odyssey game of 1972. Analogic and geography. Odyssey comes complete with 12 electronic games and educational experiences. Many more are optionally available like a shooting gallery, a prehistoric safari. Odyssey is an electronic teacher. Odyssey is a total play and learning experience for all ages. Odyssey, it's new from Magnavox. Odyssey. Odyssey is an electronic teacher. Odyssey is a total play and learning experience for all ages. 
Odyssey. It's new from Magnavox. You want, want me to play the Simon game? Yeah. That's, happens to have batteries in it by sheer coincidence. I haven't been robbed. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Uh, Atari had built this upright box called Touch Me, which had four big buttons on it and plays a game very similar to Simon or vice versa. I saw that, and the execution was not, well, it was a dark cabinet. It made ugly sounds, but the gameplay was great. So I said to um, Howard Morrison, one of the partners at, uh, at uh, Marvin Glass, we ought to do a game like that. And then uh, I faked one without a processor, and they play that. They say, hey, this is uh, pretty good. Let's, um, let's do this. And then, um, I talked to Lenny Cope, who was my assistant at Sanders, and who worked for me on stuff after hours. And they said, uh, let's emulate this thing. And uh, Lenny programmed this thing with my inputs and Howard Morrison's inputs. And I, I kept building the hardware, and I did things like uh, uh, decide the uh, the, the tones that went into Simon. You have to have four tones that are consonant with each other that, that don't sound dissonant when you play them in any sequence. Turns out I went through my kids' uh, encyclopedia, uh, the Compton Encyclopedia. I found that the bugle plays everything with G, C, E, and G. So that's what went into Simon. And part of what made Simon successful is because it sounded good. Deliberately did that. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be here forever. Uh, What's your best Simon? What's my best? Go. Who knows? Uh, I'm sure I could go quite a distance back in the distant past. <laughs> uh, I got invited to, to the official demonstration of Simon to the press in New York. We were at the Wall of Astoria the night before. They take us by limo to Club 57, is it or 54, downtown someplace? And I go in there, and there's this lights blinking on the ceiling, you know, and people dancing on the floor, about a foot off the floor because everybody was on kind of, some kind of substance. And about one o'clock in the morning, finally, a huge Simon floated across uh, the ceiling, <laughs> and the marketing manager got out of that. Had a spiel that this time, most of us were up on the third floor, what was once the theater. I don't know what, what they accomplished with that, but they showed it to the press, but it was such a natural game that it took off like uh, gangbusters. And this thing had uh, two, uh, two uh, D cells in it because the, uh, the, the lights in here, this is pre LED days. Today, modern Simons run off um, three triple A's. They speak, they sing, they talk, they all but waltz off the table, they do all sorts of things. But this, you know, this poor thing had to work off a four bit processor with one key of memory. Yeah. One key of four-bit memory. That wasn't easy. I come with come up with game ideas whose technology attracts me. For example, uh, there's a Dora doll over here. I did a Dora doll. It's outside in the display area. Uh, you can hold a flashcard out in front of her, and she reads the flashcard. She does this. Huh? So this is a dog. Right? Uh, got a picture of a dog. <coughs> Why does it interest me? How do I read a flashcard at a distance? I do that by generating a, a, light of, a line of IR that sweeps across space, focused, reads a barcode with IR absorbing ink on the card, sends the IR light back that's got the code on it, which is received by an IR receiver in an amulet that she wears around her neck, and then she speaks whatever, uh, whatever it says on the card. It's a technical challenge. So I start to come up with the idea of doing this, and once I'm on that, I want to build it and finish it. That's a, that's a vehicle. The whole thing was to build something like a, a, a not only remote control, but something that reads the speed of the vehicle. But I don't think this one has batteries in it. My grandkids come here and they burn up all the batteries. These are the production items. I don't have the originals that we did. Uh, uh, talk. Let's get to work! Talk. Now let's go the other way! That's the way to build it! Yeah, ideas are ideas, executing them, 
isn't the hardest thing in the world, selling the stuff. That's the hard part. I will no longer attempt to work in high tech, real high tech area. It's impossible. I cannot compete with 100 people in a media lab at MIT and a uh, similar number at Carnegie uh, Mellon and all over the place in Austin, Texas, doing their thing all day long. Impossible. So I do, but I'm on still 20-year-old technology with creative uh, regurgitation of things that have been done before, uh, slight variations on the theme of Haydn, uh, just to keep my noggin going, uh, keep from getting uh, mentally defective, do a little software on the computer behind me, do hardware, have fun building stuff. There's a game over there I built recently. It's got a couple of microprocessors in it. Let's see if we can get it to work. This one guy sh shooting at another. You're out. Try again. You missed. Bonk. I got him. You missed. Oh, shucks. You missed. Bonk. Got him. Bonk. Got him. Um, I'm getting pretty good at this. Is this going anywhere? No, it's just for me. Uh, just packaging this thing. You know, a little bit of a challenge. Squeezing everything in the box. There's a photo sensor here, so when you get too close, it says back off. You know? <laughs>